Good evening. Good evening and welcome very, very much to Conversations, where we're pleased to welcome to the program Dr. Richard Bullitt. And uh, Mr. Bullitt is director of the Middle East Institute at Columbia University and is a writer and a historian of uh, the Middle Eastern part of the world. And Dr. Bullitt, welcome very, very much to Conversations. Yep. Thanks for having me here. I wonder if you might share for myself and for the general television audience, we want to talk in some detail about the Islamic world, as it were. You're a historian. Maybe you could fill us in in a broad brush kind of way just on the very elemental developments of, uh, of the Islamic culture. I know off camera we said this is in a very exciting time for members of the Islamic world now uh, after a history, but maybe you could just share in a, a broad survey kind of way the development of the, of the, of the Islamic uh, political and economic and cultural force historically. Sure. Let me do this very um, you know, sort of big chunks. Good. First of all, there are about 800 million Muslims in the world today. Yeah. Uh, the vast preponderance of them do not live in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The Middle East has a minority of the Muslim people. Most of them live in to the east of the Middle East, that is, say, in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Indonesia yeah. China, uh -huh. uh, the Philippines, uh, Soviet Union. Uh, and many of them live in Africa, in the, uh, south of the Sahara Desert, not part of the Middle East. How did, how did that come, if I may, to have such a wide geographical expanse? There was uh, African tra uh, Arab traders, or what was it that well, carried the... Well, there's no real consensus yeah. on that. It, it spreads in different areas at different times. One of the reasons people focus on Islam in the Middle East yeah. is because that's the first area. That's the root. Yeah. yeah. Muhammad is uh, born somewhere around 570. A.D., he has his first uh, revelation at about the age of 40, mm -hmm. in which he felt he had messages from God bringing the latest and final version of God's word to man. In the a monotheistic tradition that's of the right. Judeo Christian. The, yeah. the latest in the sense that Muhammad would be a messenger in, the, in a sequence of messengers that includes Jesus, Moses, Abraham, and so on. Uh -huh. So, uh, this uh, message galvanized a group of supporters around Muhammad. Then you have a great deal of disagreement as to what happens next. Uh, some people argue that the, the religious fervor of the people who gather around, gathered around Muhammad um, led to a stunning series of conquests in which by the year 711, everything from the Indus River in the east to Spain in the west had been conquered by Arab and to some area, in some areas also Berber armies. Mm -hmm. Uh, other people will argue that the religion was not yet the motive force for the average Arab soldier, that these were nomads from tribes, or at least people with um, other motivations, perhaps, and that there were other factors involved. And no one is really in agreement. It is a, an article of faith for Muslims that Islam, during the lifetime of the Prophet and of his close companions, as they're called, mm -hmm. say in the first century uh, from the beginning of Islam uh, to the uh, right around the year 700, mm -hmm. it's an article of faith that this is when Islam was lived most perfectly. Mm -hmm. Other people would say that might be true for a group of people who knew about Islam, who were the actual friends of Muhammad, mm -hmm. who saw him, knew how he inspired people, knew how he prayed, how he carried on his everyday activities. But was it really for everyone? Because after all, most people were not Muslims. And this question of whether or not it was a religiously inspired thing or more of a political, cultural, Arab thing it's very hard is to one tell. that is hard to tell. And some historians talk about the Arab conquest. Some uh, will talk about the Muslim conquest, the uh -huh. Islamic conquest. Muslim simply means a person who has made submission, Islam, to God. Is submission. Is so it's, the, it's the, uh, uh, the term for a person who uh -huh. believes in Islam. And Islam is the term for the religion, which is the submission uh, of man to God's will. Yeah, and it's, there, there's certain kinds of things, the, 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 the trip to Mecca, the fasting in Ramadan and so forth, and right. it's a way of life that becomes not only just religious in a, in a sense where it's separate in a certain sense, but has a, has a very strong effect upon life on an everyday sense, yeah, doesn't it? It but really does this have is, a This is the part influence. of it where, where it's difficult to, to explain it because Islam doesn't come into being full-blown. All right. It, it is God's word supplemented then by the experiences and the direct contact people had with the prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. But the Quran is a fairly compact book. It's mm -hmm. much shorter than the Bible. Mm -hmm. So that it doesn't give you everything. It gives you uh, very inspiring things. It gives you the seeds from which institutions can develop. But in fact, they could have developed in different ways mm -hmm. if 
Muhammad had been uh, born among the Eskimos, presumably you would have had a different society than if he'd been born in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And Islam would have accommodated itself to the needs of the people in a different fashion. Mm -hmm. It was a flexible uh, religion in the way that all great religions are. Mm -hmm. It took something like three or four hundred years for the bulk of the population in the Middle East itself to convert to Islam. I see, interesting, yeah. They did it gradually. There, uh -huh. there was not forced conversion. They weren't compelled to enter by economic forces, uh, you know, some sort of exorbitant taxation. There was a tax on non-Muslims, but it didn't basically cause them to convert. They converted gradually over three or four centuries. But until about the year 1000, Islam didn't expand much further. Then, starting around the year 1000, it began to move into India uh -huh. in a series of conquests that went on for years, and India gradually became ruled by Muslim rulers. Back but the people who carried on those conquests were not Arabs. Uh -huh. They were by, not. By they, that they time, were. they were Turks and Persians. Yeah, that's very interesting, but they were Islamic, or but they Muslim. Were, but they were Muslims. Uh -huh, that's interesting. Then yeah. beyond that, you had, in some areas, uh, merchants or... Uh, traders, yeah. You know, t traders or uh, mystic, uh, wandering uh, holy men uh -huh. carried Islam. Uh -huh. So it has been carried by many different people in many different ways in different parts of the world, and it's adapted to local conditions in uh, certain ways. So that while all Muslims would agree that, in principle, Islam is a total way of life, both for this world and for the next, with no division between church and, st and state and so forth and so mm -hmm. on, the way in which it's articulated, the way in which it's experienced, differs in different parts of the world. Uh -huh. And the Middle East tends to be a fairly unitary body by comparison uh, with certain other areas. So Middle Eastern Islam is a bit different, and because it's the homeland, it's where other Muslims, in a sense, look to find the ideas and the tendency and the forces and the traditions that they draw upon for the development of Islam in their own region, whether it's Indonesia or Malaysia or Nigeria uh -huh. or the United States. And you have a flowering of culture in the 8th century and so forth, the, the universities and the, culture, the level of culture development and the carrying over of uh, ancient, uh, tr uh, you know, classical historian, so okay, let, let's, culture. Uh, one of the problems with Islam is that we have a tendency to, to look at it in a static fashion. I'm a historian. Yeah. I have yeah, to look at right, things as they develop. Right. In the 8th century, uh, in the 9th century, you have, well, let's say the 8th century, that's talked about as the golden age of the flower. That's what I was trying to get at, yeah, yeah the sense of gold. But in age. fact, most of the people were not Muslims at that time. Interesting. Most it? of the people yeah. in the Middle East were Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, yeah. and so on. They hadn't yet converted to Islam. What happened in the 8th century was a tremendous amount of urbanization. Yeah. Cities grew in a phenomenal pace. Universities and No, not, not no. at that time. No, not well, at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the cities grew, and with them came trade and manufacturers. You had a... a tremendous explosion in uh, technology, in uh, commerce, and things like that. One of the major factors in the growth of the cities was a reorientation of wealth, a redistribution of wealth that came because the Muslim armies extracted wealth and spent it in different ways. Uh -huh. But a large part of it was because the people who converted to Islam wanted to go to where the Muslims were. And the Arabs had decided to rule from urban centers. So you had a migration inward into some places some place have been fairly small mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. grew into cities as Muslims moved in to be in these centers. So that the cultural development of Islam after the initial period in Arabia with Muhammad, yeah. the cultural development was largely in these cities that were burgeoning cultural and economic centers with large numbers of converts who moved in. And it gave a certain urban cast, particularly mm -hmm. to the higher, more <coughs> literary character of Islam. Mm -hmm. In those cities, you also had a translation into Arabic, which is becoming the language of all the Muslims for literary purposes and for scientific purposes. You had a translation of works from Greek, from Sanskrit, from Pahlavi, the Middle Persian language, oh. from Syriac into Arabic. And so in the 8th century, it is golden in the sense that you have this burgeoning urbanization movement. You have translation, the transmission of the lore of several different civilizations into the common language of Islam. And of course, what makes Islam special is that it creates this, this commonwealth, in a sense, in the Middle East, after centuries of being split with, into empires, speaking different languages. Now you have something that is drawing it together and is 
using a single language and a single religious cultural idiom. Then Arabic to would, be, would begin to be spoken throughout that. It, yes. Uh, and where it wasn't spoken, it was still used for educational Literary. purposes. Yeah, right. Educational and religious purposes. Yes. The Quran was based in that. So then you go on another uh, 300 years later. Starting around 1100, you begin to get uh, formalized institutions of learning, which then take off and become universities. But in fact, many of the most important, if not most of the most important intellectual achievements came before you had uh, formalized higher education. Yeah, there was a bridge with the ancient tradition. One ancient could argue in our own history yeah. that uh, higher education has stifled some of the best ideas too, but <laughs> well, that's yeah. something else. No, I, just, I understand what you're saying, but it was a bridge culture with the with the classical traditions and so forth, which yeah. was carried over, and they were in a in a position of intellectual enlightenment when Europe was in uh, great. Uh, yeah, they're crawling know, around in great. caves in Europe. Yeah. I mean, oh, well, really, nearly so. I really, mean, the, having, yeah. There are uh, similarities, however, with Europe that are rather striking. Universities come along at the same time, certain kinds of religious movements at the same time. And indeed, one could make an argument that if you looked at this whole business historically with, from a broad enough perspective, you could see Islam and Christianity as simply uh, Siamese twins severed at birth that were growing up in the same pattern. It's interesting. It's all in the monotheistic Western tradition and yeah. so forth. Yeah, and which uh, is, uh, if you were a Hindu scholar, it would all uh, seem like you know cousins. Yeah, I uh, see. Squabbling among themselves. Oh, I see, yeah. But the thing is, then you go on, and by about 1400, there's a fairly stable uh, cultural pattern that we now think of as normative Islam mm -hmm. or traditional Islam. By 1400, that pattern is pretty well established. You have a society, by this time, India has become uh, heavily uh, affected by Islam, and Islam is pushing, uh, has taken over in Turkey and pushed into the Balkans, and it's moving out into other parts of the world. But the important thing about this traditional normative society that came into being by about 1400 was that it was had complex institutions that were closely interrelated, and people had a very strong sense of place. It was one of, in a sense, I think one of the most successful social syntheses in history, mm -hmm. in the sense that people knew who they were and where they were, no. but at the cost of a de-emphasis on individuality, a de-emphasis upon uh, accumulation of money purely for its own sake, uh, a de-emphasis upon um, inventiveness, so that the, the values that now many of today's Muslims look for in their religious political movements of community, authenticity, a sense of identity, of place, of knowing who they are and where they are, those are sort of nostalgic memories of a time when all that was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what they didn't have were the things that we had in the West at that time. Which we began to develop. That's right, which caused a, a strong difference between the two areas. But of course, one of the things that's absolutely astonishing to me in the last few years is how often in news media people talk about in the Middle East where people have been killing each other for centuries and have traditional feuds and wars and so on. <coughs> the Middle East, <coughs> prior to about middle of the 19th century, the Middle East for a number of centuries internally was one of the most peaceful and safe parts of the world. Mm -hmm. The people who've been killing each other for centuries are the Europeans. They sure have. And for the Europeans and Americans to turn around and talk about the Middle East as full of wars mm -hmm. is, is utter irony. We're in the longest period of European peace since Emperor Augustus, mm -hmm. I believe. But that was a vast expanse all the way from Spain to Indonesia, as it were, mm -hmm. and there were many, many geographical differences. There were what would come to be called, thought of in the modern experience, national difference, differences, regional differences within that vast expanse geographically and culturally of the peoples that were under Islam. There were these differences. One of the differences, I wonder if maybe you could share it uh, or, or perhaps uh, clear it up for us, is the, uh, the, the Ali and the, the, uh, the development of the, the Shiite mm -hmm. Muslim as opposed to the okay, Sunni Muslim. The, that, clear that up for yeah, where so Sunni that? and Shia are, are useful things to get straight. Yeah. Uh, fundamentally, within Islam, there is a difference of opinion on where authority lies, mm -hmm. where the leadership of the Muslim community, called in Arabic the Ummah, uh -huh. where that lies. Uh, it's a dispute that has its roots back in the decades following the death of the Prophet Muhammad in 632. Um, but what it boils down to is that some people believe that there is a God-ordained source of authority, an individual called the imam, 
mm -hmm. who is the person who is a properly, at any given time, the head of the community in a spiritual sense, whether he has political power or not, ideally he should always have political power. And how is that decided? Okay, these people are Shiites, and they believe that that person will always be some descendant of Muhammad's first cousin and son-in-law, whose name is Ali. I see. And so it's the party of Ali, the Shiite Ali. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. The the Sunnis, the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the uh -huh. people of tradition and consensus, are the pe are people who believe that the community, in some sense, always chooses its own uh, leader, uh -huh. and that it's not a God-ordained individual, but rather it is the community coming to agree upon a certain individual, ideally thought to be uh, from the tribe that Muhammad came from in yeah, Mecca. traditional tribal social but, organization. But yeah. even so, even beyond that, the idea that this person is a, is a temporal uh, nominee of the community uh -huh. is important because he has a less spiritual, uh, less of a spiritual cachet or authority uh -huh. than the Imam of the Shiites. Yeah. The Imam of the Shiites is a in particularly after 1500 when the Shiites become dominant politically in Iran, the notion of the Imam, who by this time is a person disappeared from human society, expected uh -huh. to come back. That's the 12th Imam again. The 12th yeah. Imam. He's yeah. expected to come back at the end of time and to bring in the millennium of justice, etc. Yeah, it's interesting. We want to talk about that. Okay, now, this person is perfect. Uh -huh. And when he comes back, his rule will be perfect. It's in the Messianic tradition. That's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, for the Sunnis, they never really expect their rulers to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And they perhaps have a possibly a bit more toleration for imperfection. Mm -hmm. But basically, the Sunnis and the Shi'is have a disagreement on this issue. But when you actually get down to the day-to-day -day living, uh, they agree on many, many points. But they disagree on a number of ritual points, on the nature of prayer, the nature of pilgrimage, the nature of certain things. And sometimes when we focus abstractly upon these issues of the hidden imam or the twelfth imam uh, versus the Sunni notion of a, of a uh, elected caliph or a community chosen caliph, we miss the fact that Sunnis and Shis actually can get into quite serious disputes on much more uh, arcane. Or uh, are, well, not arcane mm, for them, no, but, but much more focused and low-level issues. Uh -huh. The issue of temporary marriage, for example. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, the, the Shiites say that Muhammad sanctioned uh, a marriage contracted for a specific period of time, which dissolves at the end of the contract. Mm -hmm. The Sunnis say he did not. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, marriage is a very touchy issue. Yeah, indeed. They Absolutely. disagree on this. Yeah, right, right. And th this was something that grew out of uh, the decades, as you say, right after the uh, the dispute, right after, right after the yeah. death of Muhammad, and that it came to be that in the whole expanse of Islam, the Sunni, the Shiites may make up maybe 10 percent or something of that order, 15 percent of uh, Muslims or some way. Allahu alam. We, we really don't know. We it's don't know. Any best guess or what, uh, the, what the breakdown is? 10 percent is, is the rule of thumb that people use, but a lot of countries simply won't take a census. Uh -huh. But it's, it, <laughs> oh really? And yeah. is that, that's important. I Pakistan, mean, for example, you find uh, remarkable differences of opinion. Uh, with among knowledgeable Pakistanis about how many Shiites are in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. It goes back almost to the beginnings of Islam, but it's one that is important now. I'm trying to understand. It has uh, become important again. Yeah. Uh, for a long time, it was not a, a major issue. Sunnis and Shis got along perfectly well together. They maintained their separate ritual practices, but it wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. and it's really with the uh, Iranian Revolution that all of this has boiled up again. And I think that we have had a, an interpretation of events since the Iranian Revolution that has overemphasized the sunni Shi'i split. And I think the reason for it is, is because our governmental policy has tried to isolate the Iranian Revolution, or at least tried to back in 79, 80, around in there, yeah. by saying, oh, this is something the Shiites are doing and no one else is, well, okay, which is well, wrong. Yeah, okay, something we want to say. We're going to take a break here if we can for me. We'll come back and pick it up there, getting up more into the contemporary situation and so forth. And I appreciate your helping set some of these things straight because there's a great deal of misunderstanding, and it's an important uh, fact that we all begin to try and understand better what the realities are there. Guest is Richard, Bar uh, Richard uh, Bullitt, uh, uh, Columbia University. We'll be coming right back momentarily. Please stay tuned. We're coming right back.
think about this. In our country, in Cyprus, this horror is reality. Since 1974, more than a third of Cyprus has been occupied by an invasion force from Turkey. We are a proud country. We have fought back every way we can. But we need help and understanding. We need you. People who love freedom. People who share our value of democracy. And this country will be won again. And we will heal that jagged red scar that is across the body of this country. I love New York. Health and racket. Back again with Dr. Richard Bullitt, Columbia University. It's interesting the history, the historical development of that, uh, of that, uh, uh, the historical development of Islam itself. The fact that we live now in the modern era and trying to understand Islam in the modern era, uh, without perhaps dwelling too much, although we'll probably have to touch on the colonial experience with the West and the modern experience that Islam has suffered and so forth, or experienced and so forth. But the event, the the revolutionary event, in your estimation, that helps to make this period perhaps the most exciting period in Islamic history, even more so even back to the beginnings of the roots of it and so forth, would perhaps, and make it a revolutionary period, is the events in Iran in terms of the overall uh, development of Islam yeah. itself, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to compare it with the beginnings of Islam. No, but, but that it's a golden, it's, it's the, a time the, of tremendous a, excitement. We're, we're probably, in my judgment, yeah. uh, this is the most exciting intellectual period uh -huh. in some 800 or 1,000 years uh -huh. in Islam. There are more ideas, more involvement, more hope, more uh, excitement in Islamic religious uh, circles and the political circles associated with them than, there, than there's been in a long, long time. And the, the Iranian revolution didn't cause this. Mm -hmm. It is a manifestation <coughs> of it. And the spectrum of religious thinking, both political and non-political, is uh, very broad, encompassing what you see in the religious tendencies in the Iranian revolution, but also going far beyond that in different directions and in different countries. A common theme that we have, maybe we should go, if we don't mind, to the fact that we had brought it up to the 14th century or so in the Islamic world, but there was the intervening period of the growth of the European colonial powers and so forth in the modern experience. That has, that has had a strong impact upon uh, the thinking of the peoples in the Arab and Islamic world, the colonial experience of the European powers yes. and so forth, up the 18th, 19th, and even in the 20th century. Yeah. The has colonial experience has been an important one, or more, for the Middle East it's more the imperialist experience. All right, but yeah. you have to recall, most of the Middle East was not colonized. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not talking about Latin America or Africa or Southeast Asia. Okay, good. We're talking about areas where... Uh, some places, such as Algeria from 1830 on, were colonized, mm -hmm. and they had to fight a bitter fight and win, a bitter war, mm -hmm. to achieve their independence. And they become a, a very distinctive country because of that. Mm -hmm. But most parts of the Middle East did not experience that kind of colonization. There were the Ottomans. And the Ottomans mm -hmm. ruled in the area, yeah. but then after World War I, uh, the French and the British moved into certain areas. Well, the French and the British never, in most of the areas they occupied, thought they were going to move in a lot of people, settle, have plantations, sell crops. The Middle East wasn't worth a whole lot until mm -hmm. oil came along. Yeah, and so it, it experienced imperialism. It, it experienced, it had the humiliating experience of being a political football, right. being L thrown around, its own wishes ignored, but it didn't have colonization. It didn't have colonization. It was a co quasi-colonization experience or imperialistic mm -hmm. experience. Libya had... Uh, Libya had colonization. Had colonization with the Italians. With the Italians. With devastating effect. That's I mean, right. So, so that Libya and Algeria would have an experience uh, that, oh, say, Iraq and uh, Syria would not have in the same way. No. Uh -huh. And countries like Turkey remained... Uh, yeah. But the British and French experiences in Syria and Tunisia and the British in uh, Palestine and in Egypt and so forth, the Suez Canal, uh, colonization in India, that presence, the European presence, has been something that has marked the political and the cultural 
psychology, psychology of the Islamic yeah. world and the modern experience, and one against which the revolution was, in a certain sense, uh, fought. Yes, or well, is being fought, perhaps. You, one argument one could make is that the a previous generation achieved uh, political independence, and what is happening now is a new generation is trying to achieve cultural independence uh -huh. uh, as a continuation from political fighting political imperialism to fighting cultural imperialism. All right. But it's a little more complex than that because I'm sure. yeah. the governments in the Middle East, the Ottoman government, the government in Egypt in the 19th century, really in a way collaborated with Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, they collaborated in that both of them, uh, Europe wanted to control things. The Ottomans didn't want them to control it. So they were op opposed in that respect. But they collaborated in collaborate in the sense that they wanted to diminish the influence of the religious authorities. They wanted to diminish the power of Islam. The Europeans, because they were a strongly Christian area, that hated Islam. Mm -hmm. And there's a strong undercurrent Going of Going back to the Crusades. Huh? Strong yeah. undercurrent of anti-Islamic yeah. feeling in the West uh, down to this country in the present day. Uh -huh. Okay, that's one current. They wanted to diminish Islam for religious reasons. The governments in the Middle East wanted to diminish Islam because it was a counterweight to their authority. To their political authority. That's right. If they could diminish it, they could become... Uh, the you know, the rulers. the sort of authoritarian rules right. rulers they wish to be. That's they it. used the European techniques. Mm -hmm. They built European type armies, used European communications methods, used European totalitarian techniques to develop by the middle of the 20th century. And in the minds of many of the uh, Islamic people, they uh, were going against the precepts of Islam and some of the traditional That's right. values that had been important to the culture. Mm -hmm. But at the, in the 19th century, no. Islam was being attacked from within and without so effectively, mm -hmm. with its schools, its legal system, all this diminished, mm -hmm. and uh, in many cases destroyed, mm -hmm. they didn't have, the, have a power to do much about right, it. Right, right. So it'd but be by, frustrating. It'd be frustrating the, condition. By the middle yeah. of the 20th century, you yeah. have a series of essentially military dictatorships, European style, with European style, style ideologies. And these are not seen as creations of an Islamic civilization, except by themselves, mm -hmm. by the religiously motivated political figures these are seen as, in a sense, um, the children of, imp of imperialism. Yeah, Quisling. So yeah, that yeah. Uh, Anwar Sadat yeah. uh, was regarded as a, he was called pharaoh by his opponents in Egypt, the, using the term for one of the most evil people in the Quran. Wow. Uh, and killing pharaoh yeah. was the way they termed the killing of Sadat. Yeah. Uh, some of the most radical Islamic groups feel that they're the only Muslims around and that all the other people who are Muslims they can kill because they are simply secular people following secular governments. I wonder if you could trace radical in the sense of the Islamic world or the Arabic world, what we mean radical when we talk about the radicals. The radicals would be those who would try and reclaim the claims of Islam in terms of uh, life against political authority or radical. And of course the, okay. the revolution against the Shah and so forth is uh, Radical is uh, always yeah. a touchy term because yeah. it's uh, semantically loaded. Mm -hmm. uh, our government always uses radical for the people we don't like yeah. and moderate for the people we do like. Radical or terrorist and or something. Yeah. totally uh, yeah. irrational the way yeah. they do it. Uh -huh. um, within the uh, Islamic spectrum of politics, I say radical are the people who, who believe that they can only achieve their goals through revolutionary overthrow. Through re revolutionary overthrow of these governments that were established right. in the quasi now, In the secular regime. Uh, in wh uh, when you're talking about secular governments like that of Syria or Iraq or Egypt, uh, radical means uh, governments that feel they can only achieve their political goals through the use of uh, violent means, whether it is war or terrorism or internal uh, police state uh, suppression. Uh -huh. So we have radicals in the secular or the non-religious area and radicals in the religious area. We also have non-radicals in these areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, in the case of Iran, came to power in the middle of the 1920s. He came from a very humble background. Uh, he was a self-made man, a military man. He was chosen Shah by the Iranian legislature established through the Constitutional Revolution of 1906. Mm -hmm. um, he then created a myth, uh -huh. the myth of a monarchy that wasn't simply the successor of the Shahs that he supplanted, 
but of a grand uh, Iranian monarchy that went for 2,500 years. Uh -huh. The Iranian nation bought into that myth. They did. Yeah. It never made much sense. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But when the, when the Shah celebrated 2,500 years of Iranian, continuous Iranian imperial greatness, it was, and it was splashed all over American uh, magazines and newspapers, th this was a kind of myth. Uh -huh. The fact of the matter was that you had a family that militarily seized power, legitimized themselves with the title of Shah, and then proceeded to turn their country into an absolute uh, monarchy. And it worked. It wor I, I recall the last time I was there in 1977, or actually before, the 1971, I recall being astonished to be in an absolute monarchy and how, anach how anachronistic it was. How could it really exist uh -huh. to have it be a monarchy with uh, almost sort of comic opera overtones to it? Uh -huh. But under this, there was a rejection that had been going on for several decades, particularly since 1953 with the overthrow of Mossadegh. And this led to a revolution, and it brought to the fore Ayatollah Khomeini, who is probably the most important political figure uh, in the 20th century, at least within the Islamic world. Uh, interesting. And he is in the Shiite tradition again. Yes. You say you think that's overstressed. Maybe we should. He's in the Shiite tradition of... Uh, of, uh, of being uh, representing is a certain sense, I don't know if underclass is correct, but a smaller representation in terms of the broader Islamic world. And that class, if you could again, the, the fact that uh, Mohammed, uh, I mean, the, the fact that uh, Khomeini is in the Shiite tradition in Iran, which you said had been converted to Shiism, mm. uh, uh, I I is a significant thing? You think it's overrated, no. the, 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 no, the it's, conflict? It's, it's One important. tries to understand the current conflict between uh, between. Khomeini and Iran and uh, much of the rest of the Arab world, which yeah. tends to be Sunni, and is, it's an oversimplification to see the root of that conflict as being a Shiite or religiously I based root I think problem an, between I think it's an uh, Iran and the rest of the Arab yeah. world. I think it's but an oversimplification to see that, but it's not irrelevant. Uh -huh, okay. it's, it's just putting it in its due place. Khomeini's position was made possible partly by his own personal background and intellectual and political abilities, partly by the fact that Iran, compared with other Islamic countries, was much less developed, so that the religious institution, the framework of mullahs and so forth, had more independence and more resources under the control than their parallel people did in the Sunni world, mm -hmm. in most of the Sunni world. That's interesting. That and would be the case wherever the Shiite was uh, predominant. No, that, no, no that, that was just Iran All right. for geopolitical reasons. Ir right. Iran is a backwater. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, uh, but it was also an, uh, empowered, Khomeini's rise was empowered by the fact that within the Shiite tradition, they have a attitude toward authority mm -hmm. in the religious sphere that mm -hmm. is different and more acute than the Sunni attitude. Mm -hmm. So it made it possible for Khomeini to, to gain more prominence than perhaps he could have in the Sunni world. But mm -hmm. also, he had the network around him. He had the other mullahs. He had the other uh, people who had congregations and schools under the control who acted as his network mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and who have actually formed the, the, the infrastructure of the Islamic Republic of Iran. With uh, a real religious fervor. That's I mean, right. They have a real religious, have a religious fervor. fervor. Yeah. Now, in the Sunni world, most of the people who would be parallel to the Shiite mullahs are on government payroll mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and aren't going to rock the boat. So that when you have leadership in the... Well, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be constituted as wanting to rock the boat. Oh, or they, they, they or could they have been at an earlier period. Uh -huh, okay. But over time, they have been uh, sort of removed from the center of affairs. Mm -hmm, their mm -hmm. independence, their control of institutions, their control of resources has been stripped from them, and they no longer have the power. When you find leadership in the Sunni areas, it tends to be outside the, cler outside the clergy, outside the official people, or uh, with minor figures who are not holding government uh, positions. This is not inherent in Sunni versus Shi. Mm -hmm. This is simply a matter of the historical development of the Shiite area of Iran and the more economically developed uh, areas in the Sunni world. The but the kind of authority any Sunni uh, Alan, any Sunni religious leader can command, doesn't have quite the intensity as a kind of authority that an ayatollah mm -hmm. can command within Iranian Shiism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is this is this is something that's well to understand the fact, and also with this tradition of the Imam, the tradition 
of their emerging a, a, a leadership, a mess messianic tradition in a certain sense, being fulfilled lends itself to the, to the, to the fervor of the, of, the, of the Iranian experience. And one wonders what the attitude of the broader Islamic world is toward the phenomena of, uh, of Iran itself, the revolutionary Iran, which sets what could be a model for fundamental changes in other parts of the Islamic world. I wonder if that's sure. seen as a threat by other people. So I wonder if we could pick, we have to take a break now if you don't okay. mind. We have to take, maybe we could pick up that theme of uh, the rest of the Islamic world or the broader world perhaps relating to the Iranian revolutionary experience when we come back if you don't mind. Okay, again, Richard uh, Bullets, our guest, uh, professor of history at uh, Columbia University. We're going to be coming right back momentarily. I ask you to stay tuned, coming right back. Thank you. Yeah, back again with Richard Bullitt from uh, Columbia University, and this question of the of the of the modern attitude. Let's say the the hinge event of the Iranian Revolution, and what it perhaps could be seen as a model for others, or what the effects of it is. What the attitude of the broader Arab, not to say Muslim world, is toward the rather unique experience of a very fervent and uh, religiously oriented and religiously oriented uh, Iranian culture that we see now. What are the general feelings that we we, we read? Conflict now developing with Saudi Arabia. There's deaths in Mecca. There are there's a war going on with Iraq. And what is the attitude of the of the tradi of the rest of the Islamic world, as it were, toward this Islamic uh, experience yeah. of Shiite? Okay, uh, this is a very complex uh, world. We're in, talking about 800 in, million yes, people. I understand. Now, uh, I would say just flat out mm -hmm. that a tremendous number of Muslims outside Iran are utterly disgusted with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Mm -hmm. Embarrassed? Some of them are embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Some of them are disgusted. Some of them are frightened. As we might be with the, the religiously we might fanatic person who possibly, is but saying doom is today or something. But or the thing is, it, it is still mm -hmm. a galvanizing kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And you have other groups, for particularly young people, particularly student types. Around the Arab world. Uh, throughout true. the Islamic world. Yeah, throughout the Islamic world. Who right. are... Um, excited, mm -hmm. who say, okay, maybe it isn't going perfectly, but it's a, uh, it is the first time, in a sense, that the Muslims, in a religious sense, have tried to run their country. And here they've held it together without it collapsing. They've fought a war for years. Uh, they fought have, the imperialist they power. They have humiliated the United States. Mm -hmm. They have overthrown the Shah. Look what they have achieved. No one thought the Shah's government, you know, no one who dislikes the Islamic Republic, except, you know, Iranian monarchists, mm. wants to have the Shah back. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's a very exciting uh, time, and you will find Muslim populations split. Interestingly, when you talk about Sunni and Shia, you can find Sunnis, politically active Sunnis, in a country like Malaysia, mm -hmm. who go to Tehran to learn about the Islamic Republic, even though it's a Shiite government. And you can find Muslim brothers from Kuwait who will go to Tehran, even though the Muslim Brotherhood in Kuwait is a Sunni uh, organization. They will go to Tehran because politically, leaving aside Sunni and Shia, for people who want to see a fundamental change in the way the Islamic world runs its affairs, it's a very exciting uh, example of what could happen. And in a sense, if you look back 
at European history after the French Revolution, and I, would, I don't think it's wrong to compare the Iranian Revolution with the French, you can look as really? wow. not at all. That major, you yeah. can look at the excesses of the, of the reign of terror. But if you were one of the people who participated in the revolutions of 1830 or 1848 yeah. in other parts of Europe, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be thinking about the terror. You'd be thinking about the overthrow of the monarchy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You'd be thinking about the, the ideals, the theories. And in fact, the people who use the French Revolution as a model didn't use all parts of it. They didn't use the revolting parts of it. They didn't use Napoleon. They used only the parts they wanted. And I think that that's one thing we have to keep in mind in looking at the Islamic Republic of Iran and at the person of Ayatollah Khomeini is that we may see him whole because we're outsiders. And we may see a lot that we really find uh, revolting. But there is a selectiveness in the way in which people who are within a society or tradition, selectiveness in the way they use things. And they aren't necessarily going to look at the same things that you or I would look at. Mm -hmm. And I think that that revolution will become, in some sense, a model. But perhaps we want, or can't even see now the ways in which it will be a model. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little hard for Westerners and uh, Europeans, in a sense, who had fought model uh, revolutions against entrenched religious authority, entrenched, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, religious authority that they tried to set, set models. Because here you have the religious authority that is, in a certain sense, being is it the religious, uh, the, 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 the religious values and the religious tradition, or is it the political authority and the economic authority and the political power that is being manifest by Iran that is largely being um, applauded by the peoples, let's say, inside and outside of Iran, that are so fervently in support of Ayatollah Khomeini? Is I would it a say religious or is it a political? I would say both, that, that what they but are, what draws them is the idea that it, it's now demonstrated that it is possible in the latter years of the 20th century uh -huh. to establish a regime in which the, the society, the economy, the politics revolve around Islam and not have that regime be a uh, military uh, dictatorship. Or not have that be a political military dictatorship. The, and in a certain one thing sense, I should, well, no. let me point out something about the Islamic Republic of, of Iran is that it, you know, we tend to overlook it, but it does have a parliament. Mm -hmm. The parliament does function. Yeah. There are things that Khomeini is known to have supported that he has not been able to get through the parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, we focus so much upon the sort of magnetic uh, and you know, malevolent image of Khomeini that we overlook the way in which that government actually functions. Mm -hmm. and, but the people who use it as a, as a uh, if, if not a model, as an inspiration, might not look might not overlook these things. And we said earlier about there are people who might look with derision toward Iran and so forth within the uh, Muslim world, but there are also many people who look to it as a potential model, and there are people in positions of authority who perhaps fearfully look at it as a model for sweeping yes. now, I think that over the Islamic world and, 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 and galvanizing the whole Islamic world with this religious fervor yeah. that would be perhaps signaling the end of time or yeah. some sort of messianic well, uh, let's millennial leave, view of Let's leave the messianic stuff out. The messianic oh. stuff has been used throughout history by Christians and you know, Jews and Well, Muslims we have the Jewish and, state in Israel now in this, yeah, uh, and, and this messianism kind of thing, gets things uh, muddied up. Oh, uh, Sunnis oh. can be messianic as well, you oh, see. Oh, oh okay. But the, the fear that what happened in Iran could either in a revolutionary or evolutionary way take over in other areas mm -hmm. it, is very important in governing circles in the Islamic world, and particularly in the Arab world. Um, we're now in a kind of Metternichian phase uh -huh. in the Arab world. Uh -huh. We were accustomed 20 years ago to the idea that the Arab countries were always fighting each other. Uh -huh. They're not fighting each other anymore. Well, they have been in not the Arab countries. They're more, but, yeah. well, right, uh -huh. but that's very important. Yeah. Uh, okay. The struggle among this Arab party and that Arab party in this country and that country was at one time very common. Now, the Arab uh, governments, even though they still disagree on things, they're not really fighting each other because they're all threatened. They are all fearful that something is creeping up on them. That something being? That something being the Islamic tendency with Iran as the model, if not specifically the Iranian form. They don't want to become, to destabilize themselves by getting into wars with each other and provide an opportunity for this something to overthrow them. Well, now, so it's the same sort yeah. of thing that you had with Metternich in Europe. The mm -hmm. idea is 
let's not have any change. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have extremely static governments throughout the Arab world. Mm -hmm. it's, we're, even though we call some of them radical and some of them moderate, they're all uh, terribly conservative in many important respects. And the United States supports that idea. Uh, they support the conservative thing. Right? That's right. Yeah. Now, and then the United States is seen in uh, traditional terms as the enemy against which so much of the vitriolic uh, rhetoric and so forth is directed on the part of the Khomeini. That is the embodiment of the evil in an ultimate sense, since they're supporting some of these other forces yeah. that is being fought against. And that's there's a, why they, there's there's a the, manipulation the, the, of this. Well, they, but there is a strong feeling against the United States, Israel, in a tremendously strong sense of that uh, as being the evil, the, the Satan that, yeah, that they identify well, as no, part of no, Iran. No, you're looking at this in terms of the things that we pay most attention to. Well, yes. I but suppose. now, in the time of the Iranian Revolution, the people who were uh, the enemy were the upper class who were associated with the Shah's regime, the Tohutis, as they uh -huh, were called, okay, the yeah. worshippers of Tohut, uh -huh. this uh, demonic character in the Quran. Mm. Um, the West was not the West of, uh, you know, New Jersey. Yeah. It was the West of a westernized upper class in Tehran. Yeah, Most right. of the people in Iran didn't know what the West, in our sense, was like. Yeah. Now, the the raising of Israel and the United States as the Satan. targets, the Satans, yeah. um, was good politics. Uh -huh. And there was enough sub substance to it, both with our uh, intrusion into Iran, into Iranian politics in 1953 when we helped overthrow Mossadegh, and our letting the Shah into this country for medical treatment. Uh, this was enough. And uh, our lack of general policy that's been able to give us a positive role in that part of the world hasn't yeah, helped. That hasn't helped. So. We became a target. We were not intrinsically a target. And in the lives of many Americans, it's, uh, or many Iranians, it's still a rather remote, sloganeering type thing. And it's the internal revolution, in a sense, that has come home to the lives of people there more. But we don't stress that because we are more interested in things that touch upon us. But now that we are uh, aligned with this notion that we have to help the current Arab governments preserve themselves in power in the sort of Metternichian uh, with our, with our notion. With our flagging of uh, Kuwaiti yeah. tankers and so forth. We're going to support the Saudis. We're yeah. going to support the we're, we're going. We don't want to ally with them, but we don't want to see them undermined because that seems like Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going with a policy rather ill-formed, or rather not very well or consistently thought out, that does leave us in potential danger if, in fact, the wave of the future tends to be Islamic politics. My own opinion Islamic is... Islamic politics a la, a, la, a, la, a la Iran. Not necessarily in a revolutionary form. Mm -hmm. My guess is that uh, that kind of revolution will only happen once. Mm -hmm. But gradually you will have the uh, ruling groups or the dominant groups in countries turning more toward this uh, to head off or to co-opt this movement. There must be among, maybe among some of the young, some of the radicals, some of the disaffected, some of the poor peoples and so forth, there must be a sense of identification with the, uh, with the materialistic gains of the Iranian revolutions they would see. There are others who would speak for the underclasses of that part of the world against the rulers of that part of the world, and also the underclasses uh, against the imperialist powers in general, whether it's neo-imperialism of the United States and so forth, the poor, third world peoples of the world. And so there must be a appeal for that. And there's pan-Arabism, there's pan-Islamic sentiment among all of the peoples of the Islamic world that has been in various ways expressed. There's national differences between them and there's even fighting between Islam and uh, around Iraq and so forth. But the idea of a pan-Islamic or a pan-Arab sentiment uh, runs strong or could and does it run at different levels? And is there a difference oh, between it, it, the underclasses yeah. and the leaders of the various societies? And is Khomeini a threat, but his appeal mostly to the underclasses uh, of the various uh, Arab states that now make up the yeah, Arab and Islamic it, it, it world? Very complex Sorry. issues. Um, the governments of Islamic states, the governments of states in, that have a predominantly Muslim population, have Muslim rulers, <coughs> by and large are um, are the people who feel that they're threatened by this. But they aren't threatened by it as an, as an instrument of the lower class in particular. Some of these governments are socialist governments that have um, attempted to improve education and succeeded. Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, which is 
essentially a police state, mm -hmm. nevertheless has done, taken great strides in improving education, improving welfare, in uh, improving the situation of women and so forth. In many ways, it has helped the underclass, and yet at the same time, it has had to, to assert a, uh, a police state presence in order to suppress uh, the kind of undermining influence uh, influences that they see stemming from the Iranian uh, revolution mm -hmm. and even before that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that it isn't a matter of a class revolution. Mm -hmm. okay. In many ways, the revolution in Iran was a bourgeois revolution mm -hmm. in which you had some people who did support an underclass, the Mostezafon, the, mm -hmm. uh, the wretched of the earth. Mm -hmm. But you had other people who were um, landowners or who were mullahs who were more conservative. One of the things that Khomeini and his closest associates have tried to get through the Iranian parliament is a land reform law. Mm -hmm. They can't do it. Right. They're blocked by the conservatives. Right, yeah. So that this isn't, is that clear? Yeah. it is a revolution that has um, stripped an upper class of its privilege, forced them in exile, and created <coughs> a very sad situation for that group of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has benefited, to some degree, a lower class, and it has narrowed the, the income spread so the richest people are not as rich as they were, and the poorest people are a little bit better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it does not overturn things in okay. the sense of a Russian revolution. Mm -hmm. And the interests in the ruling group in Iran are mixed of uh, bazaar merchants, uh, mullahs, landowners, uh, but also people from lower strata. So it's not a class revolution. It so the pan-Islamic. It's, pan it's a revolution that deals with identity, with authenticity, mm -hmm. and pan-Islamic mm -hmm. at the government level is trying to prevent this tendency from spreading. But pan-Islamic can also occur at a lower level of people who seek power rather than those who have it. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that what the Islamic, the groups of the Islamic tendency, the Islamic political movements in all of the countries in the Islamic world have connections with each other. Uh, I'm not saying there is an interdirectorate of some sort, but they know, they, they feed off each other, they describe themselves as part of a, of a single movement, whether it's Sunni or Shia, they don't really care mm -hmm. in terms of this sort of building up a sense of momentum. They, no one seems to talk about the idea of bringing all the Islamic countries together in no, some great they do not. imperium. They do not think of no. that. That does not emerge, or no. as in the way of Nasser used to speak of pan-Arabism no. or something of that No, sort. the idea okay. of, of uniting the Islamic world in a single state, I've never seen any group who believes in that. Uh -huh. But they all feel that they're part of a single movement. So they're that. fighting against forces within each of their separate societies, some more than against the, forces from outside, being imperialism or something of that sort. They're fighting against Even forces voice in their that. own societies. In a the sense, they're fighting against the West at home, uh -huh. not the West over here, uh -huh. even though we'll talk about us. Yeah. They're fighting against a cultural intrusion. Of the West. A no. Western uh, clone, mm -hmm. and in some cases a rather uh, misshapen and no. uh, unattractive clone uh -huh. that has somehow appeared in dominating over them, and they wish to get rid of it, uh -huh. not, not necessarily all of its forms and all of its advantages, but simply to get rid of its fundamental alienation from their Muslim sensibility. So it's their Muslim and their roots, that they're going back to the roots of their own traditions that they want to recapture and so forth. And the ideas of that are seen as being threatening to people who are in league, as it were, with some of the quote-unquote progressive forces of the Western experience? Oh, so, yes. Okay. Uh, the, yeah. You know, many of the, they, this, these sort of people will be opposed to a conservative monarchy like that of Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. but they'll be posed, also opposed to a secular, progressive uh, uh, party such as the Ba'ath Party in Iraq. We're not dealing here with the spectrum of political ideology with a left, right, and center mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that we inherit from European politics. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with a, a different spectrum. It's it's like you know, this is the, vis the visual, visible spectrum, and here's the you know, the uh, radio spectrum or something. The Islamic political spectrum is is different. In one minute or less, what sea changes do you see coming up in the next um, year, two, three, four years out, in one minute? I. What's your prognostication? In the short term, uh, I really don't have a prognostication. Uh -huh. uh, I think uh, it's very hard to tell. In the longer term, we're talking about 10 or 20 years, 
I think that we're going to see most of the governments in the Middle East transformed one way or another and be much more inclined toward the um, Islamic view of things. Not necessarily on the model of the Islamic Republic of Iran, but picking up from that, uh, from that example. And that's oh. the reason I think that revolution is so incredibly important in the 20th century. That, that is, uh, that, that's a real major watershed. You put it in the order with the French Revolution. I certainly do. Well, it's amazing. It's an amazing, amazing volatile part of the world. And it's just, uh, uh, in, it, it is, uh, it's a shame that we are also very ignorant of it. By and large, most of us here in the culture of the real, in the United States and the Western world, largely of the regions, we ourselves could do well to develop a more enlightened policy toward that part of the world so we might be able to inform ourselves more appropriately in terms of a policy that we could identify and resonate with that made some sense in terms of American world interest in that part of the world. Maybe it's that we don't have a way of responding to this that we need to have better understanding. But if there's better understanding to be had, it seems to me it might well come from you. And I thank you for helping, helping to thank contribute to our general having, understanding of this world. It's been your pleasure to have the perceptions of Richard um, Bullitt. He's director of the Middle East Institute at uh, <clears throat> Columbia University here in New York City, author of many, many books in the area and so forth. Happy to have been able to welcome you to uh, Conversations to share his perceptions. We here on Conversations would invite you to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back uh, again next week, uh, but that's it for this particular segment. We'll see you next week. Dr. Bullitt, once again, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you very much. Good night. We'll see you next week.